Spiritualism in America further continued. Chapter 27 The Doctor I wonder if it has struck any of my readers as strange that, during all these manifestations in England and America, I had never seen the form, nor heard the voice, of my late father, Captain Marriott. Surely if these various media lived by trickery and falsehood, and wished successfully to deceive me, some of them would have thought of trying to represent a man so well known, and whose appearance was so familiar. Other celebrated men and women have come back and been recognised from their portraits only, but, though I have sat at numbers of seances given for me alone, and at which I have been the principal person, my father has never reappeared at any. Especially, if these manifestations are all fraud, might this have been expected in America? Captain Marriott's name is still a household word amongst the Americans, and his works largely read and appreciated, and wherever I appeared amongst them I was cordially welcomed on that account. When once I had acknowledged my identity and my views on spiritualism, every medium in Boston and New York had ample time to get up an imitation of my father for my benefit had they desired to do so. But never has he appeared to me, never have I been told that he was present. Twice only in the whole course of my experience have I received the slightest sign from him, and on those occasions he sent me a message, once through Mr. Fletcher, as I have related, and once through his grandson and my son, Frank Marriott. That time he told me he should never appear to me and I need never expect him. But since the American media knew nothing of this strictly private communication, and I had seen, before I parted with them, seventeen of my friends and relations, none of whom, except Florence, Powell's, and Emily, I had ever seen in England, it is at the least strange, considering his popularity, and granted their chicanery, that Captain Marriott was not amongst them. As soon as I became known at the Berry seances several people introduced themselves to me, and amongst others Mrs. Isabella Beecher Hooker, the sister of Mrs. Harriet Beecher Stowe and Henry Ward Beecher. She was delighted to find me so interested in spiritualism, and anxious I should sit with a friend of hers, a great medium whose name became so rubbed out in my pencil notes, that I am not sure if it was Dr. Carter, or Cartwright, and therefore I shall speak of him here as simply the doctor. The doctor was bound to start for Washington the following afternoon, so Mrs. Hooker asked me to breakfast with her the next morning, by which time she would have found out if he could spare us an hour before he set out on his journey. When I arrived at her house I heard that he had very obligingly offered to give me a complimentary seance at eleven o'clock, so, as soon as we had finished breakfast, we set out for his abode. I found the doctor was quite a young man, and professed himself perfectly ignorant on the subject of spiritualism. He said to me, I don't know and I don't profess to know what or who it is that appears to my sitters whilst I am asleep. I know nothing of what goes on, except from hearsay. I don't know whether the forms that appear are spirits, or transformations, or materializations. You must judge of that for yourself. There is one peculiarity in my seances. They take place in utter darkness. When the apparitions, or whatever you choose to call them, appear, they must bring their own lights or you won't see them, I have no conductor to my seances. If whatever comes can't announce itself it must remain unknown. But I think you will find that, as a rule, they can shift for themselves. This is my seance room. As he spoke he led us into an unfurnished bedroom, I say bedroom, because it was provided with the dressing closet fitted with pegs, usual to all bedrooms in America. This closet the doctor used as his cabinet. The door was left open, and there was no curtain hung before it. The darkness he sat in rendered that unnecessary. The bedroom was darkened by two frames, covered with black American cloth, which fitted into the windows. The doctor, having locked the bedroom door, delivered the key to me. He then requested us to go and sit for a few minutes in the cabinet to throw our influence about it. As we did so we naturally examined it. It was only a large cupboard. It had no window and no door, except that which led into the room, and no furniture except a cane-bottomed chair. When we returned to the seance room, the doctor saw us comfortably established on two armchairs before he put up the black frames to exclude the light. The room was then pitch dark, and the doctor had to grope his way to his cabinet. Mrs. Hooker and I sat for some minutes in silent expectation. Then we heard the voice of a negress, singing darky songs, and my friend told me it was that of Rosa, the doctor's control. Presently Rosa was heard to be expostulating with, or encouraging someone, 
and faint lights, like sparks from a fire, could be seen flitting about the open door of the cabinet. Then the lights seemed to congregate together, and cluster about a tall form, draped in some misty material, standing just outside the cabinet. Can't you tell us who you are? asked Mrs. Hooker. You must tell your name, you know, interposed Rosa, whereupon a low voice said, I am Janet E. Powells. Now this was an extraordinary coincidence. I had seen Mrs. Powells, the mother of my friend John Powells, only once, when she travelled from Liverpool to London to meet me on my return from India, and hear all the particulars of her son's death. But she had continued to correspond with me, and show me kindness till the day of her own death, and as she had a daughter of the same name, she always signed herself Janet E. Powells. Even had I expected to see the old lady, and published the fact in the Boston papers, that initial E would have settled the question of her identity in my mind. Mrs. Powells, I exclaimed, how good of you to come and see me. Johnny has helped me to come. She replied. He is so happy at having met you again. He has been longing for it for so many years, and I have come to thank you for making him happy. Here was another coincidence. John Powells was never called anything but Powells by my husband and myself. But his mother had retained the childish name of Johnny, and I could remember how it used to vex him when she used it in her letters to him. He would say to me, If she would only call me, John, or, Jack, or anything but, Johnny. I replied, I may not leave my seat to go to you. Will you not come to me? For the doctor had requested us not to leave our seats, but to insist on the spirits approaching us. Mrs. Powell said, I cannot come out further into the room today. I am too weak. But you shall see me. The lights then appeared to travel about her face and dress till they became stationary, and she was completely revealed to view under the semblance of her earthly likeness. She smiled and said, We were all at the opera house on Thursday night, and rejoiced at your success. Johnny was so proud of you. Many of your friends were there beside ourselves. I then saw that, unlike the spirits at Miss Berry's, the form of Mrs. Powell's was draped in a kind of filmy white, over a dark dress. All the spirits that appeared with the doctor were so clothed, and I wondered if the filmy substance had anything to do with the lights, which looked like electricity. An incident which occurred further on seemed to confirm my idea. When Mrs. Powell's had gone, which we guessed by the extinguishing of the lights, the handsome face and form of Harry Montague appeared. I had known him well in England, before he took his fatal journey to America, and could never be mistaken in his sweet smile and fascinating manner. He did not come further than the door, either, but he was standing within twelve or fourteen feet of us for all that. He only said, Good luck to you. We can't lose an interest in the old profession, you know, any more than in the old people. I wish you'd come and help me, Harry, I answered. Oh, I do, he said, brightly. Several of us do. We are all links of the same chain. Half the inspiration in the world comes from those who have gone before. But I must go. I'm getting crowded out. Here's Ada waiting to see you. Goodbye. And as his light went out, the sweet face of Adelaide Nielsen appeared in his stead. She said, you wept when you heard of my death. And yet you never knew me. How was that? Did I weep? I answered, half forgetting, if so, it must have been because I thought it so sad that a woman so young, and beautiful, and gifted as you were, should leave the world so soon. Oh no, not sad. She answered, brightly. Glorious, glorious. I would not be back again for worlds. Have you ever seen your grave? I asked her. She shook her head. What are graves to us? Only cupboards, where you keep our cast-off clothes. You don't ask me what the world says about you, now, I said to her. And I don't care, she answered. Don't you forget me? Goodbye. She was succeeded by a spirit who called herself Charlotte Cushman, and who spoke to me kindly about my professional life. Mrs. Hooker told me that, to the best of her knowledge, None of these three spirits had ever appeared under the doctor's mediumship before. But now came out Florence, dancing into the room literally dancing, holding out in both hands the skirt of a dress, which looked as if it were made of the finest muslin or lace, 
and up and down which fireflies were darting with marvellous rapidity. She looked as if clothed in electricity, and infinitely well pleased with herself. Look, she exclaimed. Look at my dress. Isn't it lovely? Look at the fire. The more I shake it, the more fire comes. Oh, mother. If you could only have a dress like this for the stage, what a sensation you would make. And she shook her skirts about, till the fire seemed to set a light to every part of her drapery, and she looked as if she were in flames. I observed, I never knew you to take so much interest in your dress before, darling. Oh, it isn't the dress, she replied. It's the fire. And she really appeared as charmed with the novel experience as a child with a new toy. As she left us, a dark figure advanced into the room, and ejaculated. Ma, ma. I recognized at once the peculiar intonation and mode of address of my stepson, Francis Lean, with whom, since he had announced his own death to me, I had had no communication, except through trance mediumship. Is that you, my poor boy, I said, come closer to me. You are not afraid of me, are you? Oh, no, ma, of course not. Only I was at the opera house, you know, with the others, and that piece she recited, Ma, you know the one, it's all true, Ma, and I don't want you to go back to England. Stay here, Ma, stay here. I knew perfectly well to what the lad alluded, but I would not enter upon it before a stranger. So I only said, you forget my children, Francis, what would they say if I never went home again? This seemed to puzzle him, but after a while he answered, then go to them, Ma, go to them. All this time he had been talking in the dark, and I only knew him by the sound of his voice. I said, are you not going to show yourself to me, Francis? It is such a long time since we met. Never since you saw me at the docks, that was me, Ma, and at Brighton, too. Only you didn't half believe it till you heard I was gone. Tell me the truth of the accident, Francis, I asked him. Was there foul play? No, he replied. But we got quarrelling about her you know, and fighting, and that's how the boat upset. It was my fault, Ma, as much as anybody else's. How was it your body was never found? It got dragged down in an undercurrent, Ma. It was out at Cape Horn, before they offered a reward for it. Then he began to light up, and as soon as the figure was illuminated I saw that the boy was dressed in jumpers and jersey of dark woolen material such as they wear in the merchant service in hot climates, but over it all, his head and shoulders included, was wound a quantity of flimsy white material I have before mentioned. I can't bear this stuff, it makes me look like a girl, said Francis, and with his hands he tore it off. Simultaneously the illumination ceased, and he was gone. I called him by name several times, but no sound came out of the darkness. It seemed as though the veiling which he disliked preserved his materialization, and that, with its protection removed, he had dissolved again. When another dark figure came out of the cabinet, and approaching me, knelt at my feet, I supposed it to be Francis come back again, and laying my hand on the bent head, I asked, Is this you again, dear? A strange voice answered, with the words, Forgive, forgive. Forgive? I repeated, What have I to forgive? The attempt to murder your husband in 1856. Arthur Yelverton Brooking has forgiven. He is here with me now. Will you forgive too? Certainly, I replied, I have forgiven long ago. You expiated your sin upon the gallows. You could do no more. The figure sprung into a standing position, and lit up from head to foot, when I saw the two men standing together, Arthur Yelverton Brooking and the Madras sepoy who had murdered him. I never saw anything more brilliant than the appearance of the sepoy. He was dressed completely in white, in the native costume, with a white puggery or turban on his head. But his puggery was flashing with jewels, strings of them were hung round his neck and his sash held a magnificent jeweled dagger. You must please to remember that I was not alone, but that this sight was beheld by Mrs. Hooker as well as myself, to whom it was as unexpected as to her, and that I know she would testify to it today. And now to explain the reason of these unlooked-for apparitions. In 1856 my husband, then Lieutenant Rostchurch, was adjutant of the 12th Madras Native Infantry, and Arthur Yelverton Brooking, who had for some time done duty with the 12th, was adjutant of another native corps, 
both of which were stationed at Madras. Lieutenant Church was not a favourite with his men, by whom he was considered a martinet, and one day when there had been a review on the island at Madras, and the two adjutants were riding home together, a sepoy of the twelfth fired at Lieutenant Church's back with the intent to kill him, but unfortunately the bullet struck Lieutenant Brooking instead, who, after lingering for twelve hours, died, leaving a young wife and a baby behind him. For this offence the sepoy was tried and hung, and on his trial the whole truth of course came out. This then was the reason that the spirits of the murdered and the murderer came like friends, because the injury had never been really intended for Brooking. When I said that I had forgiven, the sepoy became, as I have told, a blaze of light, and then knelt again and kissed the hem of my dress. As he knelt there he became covered, or heaped over, with a mass of the same filmy drapery as enveloped Francis, and when he rose again he was standing in a cloud. He gathered an end of it, and laying it on my head he wound me and himself round and round with it, until we were bound up in a kind of cocoon. Mrs. Hooker, who watched the whole proceeding, told me afterwards that she had never seen anything like it before, that she could distinctly see the dark face and the white face close together all the time beneath the drapery, and that I was as brightly illuminated as the spirit. Of this I was not aware myself, but his brightness almost dazzled me. Let me observe also that I have been in the East Indies, and within a few yards length of sepoys, and that I am sure I could never have been wrapped in the same cloth with a mortal one without having been made painfully aware of it in more ways than one. The spirit did not unwind me again, although the winding process had taken him some time. He whisked off the wrapping with one pull, and I stood alone once more. I asked him by what name I should call him, and he said, the spirit of light. He then expressed a wish to magnetize something I wore, so as to be the better able to approach me. I gave him a brooch containing John Powell's hair, which his mother had given me after his death, and he carried it back into the cabinet with him. It was a valuable brooch of onyx and pearls, and I was hoping my eastern friend would not carry it too far, when I found it had been replaced and fastened at my throat without my being aware of the circumstance. Arthur Yelverton Bricking had disappeared before this, and neither of them came back again. These were not all the spirits that came under the doctor's mediumship during that seance, but only those whom I had known and recognised. Several of Mrs. Hooker's friends appeared in some of the doctor's controls, but as I have said before, they could not help my narrative, and so I omit to describe them. The seance lasted altogether two hours, and I was very grateful to the doctor for giving me the opportunity to study an entirely new phase of the science to me. Chapter 28 Mrs. Fay There was a young woman called Annie Eva Fay, who came over from America to London some years ago, and appeared at the Hanover Square Rooms, in an exhibition after the manner of the Davenport brothers and Messrs. Maskline and Cook. She must not be confounded with the Mrs. Fay who forms the subject of this chapter, because they had nothing to do with one another. Someone in Boston advised me not to go and sit at one of this Mrs. Fay's public seances. They were described to me as being too physical and unrefined, that the influences were of a low order, and the audiences matched them. However, when I am studying a matter, I like to see everything I can and hear everything I can concerning it, and to form my own opinion independent of that of anybody else. So I walked off by myself one night to Mrs. Fay's address, and sat down in a quiet corner, watching everything that occurred. The circle certainly numbered some members of a humble class, but I conclude we should see that everywhere if the fees were lower. Media, like other professional people, fix their charges according to the quarter of the city in which they live. But every member was silent and respectful, and evidently a believer. One young man, in deep mourning, with a little girl also in black, of about five or six years old, attracted my attention at once, from his sorrowful and abstracted manner. He had evidently come there, I thought, in the hope of seeing someone whom he had lost. Mrs. Fay, as she passed through the room to her cabinet, appeared a very quiet, simple-looking little woman to me, without any loudness or vulgarity about her. Her cabinet was composed of two curtains only, made of some white material, and hung on uprights at one angle, in a corner of the room, the most transparent contrivance possible. Anything like a bustle or confusion inside it, such as would be occasioned by dressing or making up, would have been apparent at once to the audience outside, who were sitting by the light of an ordinary gas burner and globe. Yet Mrs. Fay had not been seated there above a few minutes, 
when there ran out into the seance room two of the most extraordinary materializations I had ever seen, and both of them about as opposite to Mrs. Fay in appearance as any creatures could be. One was an Irish charwoman or applewoman, she might have been either, with a brown, wrinkled face, a broken nose, tangled grey hair, a crushed bonnet, general dirt and disorder, and a tongue that could talk broad Irish, and call a spade a spade at one and the same time. Biddy, as she was named, was accompanied by a street newspaper boy, one of those urchins who run after carriages and turn Catherine wheels in the mud, and who talked gutter slang in a style that was utterly unintelligible to the decent portion of the sitters. These two went on in a manner that was undoubtedly funny, but not at all edifying and calculated to drive any inquirer into spiritualism out of the room, under the impression that they were evil spirits bent on our destruction. That either of them was represented by Mrs. Fay was out of the question. In the first place, she would, in that instance, have been so clever an actress and mimic, that she would have made her fortune on the stage added to which the boy Teddy was much too small for her, and Biddy was much too large. Besides, no actress, however experienced, could have made up in the time. I was quite satisfied, therefore, that neither of them was the medium, even if I could not have seen her figure the while through the thin curtains, sitting in her chair. Why such low, physical manifestations are permitted I am unable to say. It was no wonder they had shocked the sensibility of my friend. I felt half inclined myself when they appeared to get up and run away. However, I was very glad afterwards that I did not. They disappeared after a while, and were succeeded by a much pleasanter person, a cabinet spirit called Gypsy, who looked as if she might have belonged to one of the Gypsy tribes when on earth she was so brown and arch and lively. Presently the young man in black was called up, and I saw him talking to a female spirit very earnestly. After a while he took her hand and led her outside the curtain, and called the little girl whom he had left on his seat by her name. The child looked up, screamed, Mama, Mama, and flew into the arms of the spirit, who knelt down and kissed her, and we could hear the child sobbing and saying, Oh, Mama, why did you go away? Why did you go away? It was a very affecting scene, at least it seemed so to me. The instant recognition by the little girl, and her perfect unconsciousness but that her mother had returned in propria persona, would have been more convincing proof of the genuineness of spiritualism to a skeptic, than fifty miracles of greater importance. When the spirit mother had to leave again the child's agony at parting was very apparent. Take me with you, she kept on saying and her father had actually to carry her back to her seat. When they got there they both wept in unison. Afterwards he said to me in an apologetic sort of way, he was sitting next to me. It is the first time, you see, that Mary has seen her poor mother, but I wanted to have her testimony to her identity, and I think she gave it pretty plainly, poor child. She'll never be content to let me come alone now. I said, I think it is a pity you brought her so young, and so I did. Florence did not appear, she told me afterwards the atmosphere was so rough that she could not, and I began to think that no one would come for me, when a common seaman, dressed in ordinary sailor's clothes, ran out of the cabinet and began dancing a hornpipe in front of me. He danced it capitally too, and with any amount of vigorous snapping his fingers to mark the time, and when he had finished he made a leg, as sailors call it, and stood before me. Have you come for me, my friend? I inquired. Not exactly, he answered. But I came with the cap'n. I came to pave the way for him. The cap'n will be here directly. We was in the Avenger together. Now all the world knows that my eldest brother, Frederick Marriott, was drowned in the wreck of the Avenger in 1847. But as I was a little child at the time, and had no remembrance of him, I had never dreamt of seeing him again. He was a first lieutenant when he died, so I do not know why the seaman gave him brevet rank but I repeat his words as he said them. After a minute or two I was called up to the cabinet, and saw my brother Frederick, whom I recognised from his likeness, standing there dressed in naval uniform, but looking very stiff and unnatural. He smiled when he saw me, but did not attempt to kiss me. I said, why? Fred. Is it really you? I thought you would have forgotten all about me. He replied. Forgotten little Flo? Why should I? Do you think I have never seen you since that time, nor heard anything about you? I know everything, everything. You must know, then, that I have not spent a very happy life, I said. 
never mind. He answered. You needed it. It has done you good. But all he said was without any life in it, as if he spoke mechanically, perhaps because it was the first time he had materialized. I had said goodbye to him, and dropped the curtain, when I heard my name called twice. Flo. Flo. And turned to receive my sister Emily in my arms. She looked like herself exactly, but she had only time to kiss me and gasp out. So glad, so happy to meet again. When she appeared to faint. Her eyes closed, her head fell back on my shoulder, and before I had time to realize what was going to happen, she had passed through the arm that supported her, and sunk down through the floor. The sensation of her weight was still making my arm tingle, but Emily was gone, clean gone. I was very much disappointed. I had longed to see this sister again, and speak to her confidentially, but whether it was something antagonistic in the influence of this seance room, Florence said afterwards that it was, or there was some other cause for it, I know not, but most certainly my friends did not seem to flourish there. I had another horrible disappointment before I left. A voice from inside the cabinet called out. Here are two babies who want the lady sitting under the picture. Now, there was only one picture hanging in the room, and I was sitting under it. I looked eagerly towards the cabinet, and saw issue from it the princess Gertie leading a little toddler with a flaxen pole and bare feet, and no clothing but a kind of white chemise. This was Joan, the Yonnai I had so often asked to see, and I rose in the greatest expectation to receive the little pair. Just as they gained the centre of the room, however, taking very short and careful steps, like babies first set on their feet, the cabinet spirit gypsy bounced out of the curtains, and saying decidedly, Here, we don't want any children about. She placed her hand on the heads of my little ones, and pressed them down through the floor. They seemed to crumble to pieces before my eyes, and their place knew them no more. I couldn't help feeling angry. I exclaimed, Oh! What did you do that for? Those were my babies, and I have been longing to see them so. I can't help it, replied Gypsy. But this isn't a seance for children. I was so vexed that I took no more interest in the proceedings. A great number of forms appeared, thirty or forty in all, but by the time I returned to my hotel and began to jot down my notes, I could hardly remember what they were. I had been dreaming all the time of how much I should have liked to hold that little flaxen head Yonai in my arms. Chapter 29 Virginia Roberts When I returned to New York, it was under exceptional circumstances. I had taken cold whilst travelling in the western states, had had a severe attack of bronchitis and pneumonia at Chicago, was compelled to relinquish my business, and as soon as I was well enough to travel, was ordered back to New York to recuperate my health. Here I took up my abode in the Victoria Hotel, where a lady, whose acquaintance I had made on my former visit to the city, was living. As I have no permission to publish this lady's name, I must call her Mrs. S. She had been a spiritualist for some time before I knew her, and she much interested me by showing me an entry in her diary, made four years previous to my arrival in America. It was an account of the utterances of a Mrs. Phillips, a clairvoyant then resident in New York, during which she had prophesied my arrival in the city, described my personal appearance, profession, and general surroundings perfectly, and foretold my acquaintanceship with Mrs. S. The prophecy ended with words to the effect that our meeting would be followed by certain effects that would influence her future life, and that on the 17th of March, 1885, would commence a new era in her existence. It was at the beginning of March that we first lived under the same roof. As soon as Mrs. S. found that I was likely to have some weeks of leisure, she became very anxious that we should visit the New York media together, for although she had so long been a believer in spiritualism, she had not, owing to family opposition, met with much sympathy on the subject, or had the opportunity of much investigation. So we determined, as soon as I was well enough to go out in the evening, that we would attend some seances. As it happened, when that time came, we found the medium most accessible to be Miss Virginia Roberts, of whom neither of us knew anything but what we had learned from the public papers. However, it was necessary that I should be exposed as little as possible to the night air, and so we fixed, by chance as it were, to visit Miss Roberts first. We found her living with her mother and brother in a small house in one of the back streets of the city. She was a young girl of sixteen, 
very reserved and rather timid looking, who had to be drawn out before she could be made to talk. She had only commenced sitting a few months before, and that because her brother, who was also a medium, had had an illness and been obliged to give up his seances for a while. The seance room was very small, the manifestations taking place almost in the midst of the circle, and the cabinet, so called, was the flimsiest contrivance I had ever seen. Four uprights of iron, not thicker than the rod of a muslin blind, with crossbars of the same, on which were hung thin curtains of lilac print, formed the construction of this cabinet, which shook and swayed about each time a form left or entered it. A harmonium for accompanying the voices, and a few chairs for the audience, was all the furniture the room contained. The first evening we went to see Miss Roberts there were only two or three sitters beside ourselves. The medium seemed to be pretty nearly unknown, and I resolved, as I usually do in such cases, not to expect anything, for fear I should be disappointed. Mrs. S., on the contrary, was all expectation and excitement. If she had ever sat for materializations, it had been long before, and the idea was like a new one to her. After two or three forms had appeared, of no interest to us, a gentleman in full evening dress walked suddenly out of the cabinet, and said, Kate? Which was the name of Mrs. S. He was a stout, well-formed man, of an imposing presence, with dark hair and eyes, and he wore a solitaire of diamonds of unusual brilliancy in his shirt front. I had no idea who he was, but Mrs. S. recognised him at once as an old lover who had died whilst under a misunderstanding with her, and she was powerfully affected, more, she was terribly frightened. It seems that she wore at her throat a brooch which he had given her, but every time he approached her with the view of touching it, she shrieked so loudly, and threw herself into such a state of nervous agitation, that I thought she would have to return home again. However, on her being accommodated with a chair in the last row so that she might have the other sitters between her and the materialised spirits, she managed to calm herself. The only friend who appeared for me that evening was John Powell's, and, to my surprise and pleasure, he appeared in the old uniform of the 12th Madras Native Infantry. This corps wore facings of fawn, with buttons bearing the word Ava, encircled by a wreath of laurel. The mess jackets were lined with wadded fawn silk, and the waistcoats were trimmed with three lines of narrow gold braid. Their khaki, or undress uniform, established in 1859, consisted of a tunic and trousers of a sad green cloth, with the regimental buttons and a crimson silk sash. The marching dress of all officers in the Indian service is made of white drill, with a cap cover of the same material. Their forage cloak is of dark blue cloth, and hangs to their heels. Their forage cap has a broad square peak to shelter the face and eyes. I mention these details for the benefit of those who are not acquainted with the general dress of the Indian army, and to show how difficult it would have been for Virginia Roberts, or any other medium, to have procured them, even had she known the private wish expressed by me to John Powell's in Boston, that he would try and come to me in uniform. On this first occasion of his appearing so, he wore the usual everyday coat, buttoned up to his chin and he made me examine the buttons to see that they bore the crest and motto of the regiment. And I may say here, that before I left New York he appeared to me in every one of the various dresses I have described above, and became quite a marked figure in the city. When it was made known through the papers that an old friend of Florence Marriott had appeared through the mediumship of Virginia Roberts, in a uniform of thirty years before, I received numbers of private letters inquiring if it were true and dozens of people visited Miss Roberts' seances for the sole purpose of seeing him. He took a great liking for Mrs. S., and when she had conquered her first fear she became quite friendly with him, and I heard, after leaving New York, that he continued to appear for her as long as she attended those seances. There was one difference in the female spirits that came through Virginia Roberts from those of other media. Those that were strong enough to leave the cabinet invariably disappeared by floating upwards through the ceiling. Their mode of doing this was most graceful. They would first clasp their hands behind their heads and lean backward, then their feet were lifted off the ground, and they were borne upward in a recumbent position. When I related this to my friend, Dr. George Lefferts, under whom I was for throat treatment to recover my voice, he declared there must be some machinery connected with the uprights that supported the cabinet, by which the forms were elevated. He had got it all so pat that he was able to take a pencil and demonstrate to me on paper exactly how the machinery worked, and how easy it would be to swing full-sized human bodies up to the ceiling with it. 
How they managed to disappear when they got there he was not quite prepared to say, but if he once saw the trick done, he would explain the whole matter to me, and expose it into the bargain. I told Dr. Lefferitz, as I have told many other clever men, that I shall be the first person open to conviction when they can convince me, and I bore him off to a private seance with Virginia Roberts for that purpose only. He was all that was charming on the occasion. He gave me a most delightful dinner at Delmonico's first, for which I tender him in print my grateful recollection, and he tested all Miss Roberts' manifestations in the most delicate and gentlemanly manner, skeptics as a rule are neither delicate nor gentlemanly, but he could neither open my eyes to chicanery nor detect it himself. He handled and shook the frail supports of the cabinet, and confessed they were much too weak to bear any such weight as he had imagined. He searched the carpeted floor and the adjoining room for hidden machinery without finding the slightest thing to rouse his suspicions, and yet he saw the female forms float upwards through the whitewashed ceiling, and came away from the seance room as wise as when he had entered it. But this occurred some weeks after. I must relate first what happened after our first seance with Miss Roberts. Mrs. S. and I were well enough pleased with the result to desire to test her capabilities further and with that intent we invited her to visit us at our hotel. Spiritualism is as much tabooed by one section of the American public as it is encouraged by the other, and so we resolved to breathe nothing of our intentions, but invite the girl to dine and spend the evening in our rooms with us just as if she were an ordinary visitor. Consequently, we dined together at the table d'hote before we took our way upstairs. Mrs. S. and I had a private sitting room, the windows of which were draped with white lace curtains only and we had no other means to shut out the light. Consequently, when we wished to sit, all we could do was to place a chair for Virginia Roberts in the window recess, behind one of these pairs of curtains, and pin them together in front of her, which formed the airiest cabinet imaginable. We then locked the door, lowered the gas, and sat down on a sofa before the curtains. In the space of five minutes, without the lace curtains having been in the slightest degree disturbed, Francis Lean, my stepson, walked through them, and came up to my side. He was dressed in his ordinary costume of jersey and jumpers, and had a little worsted cap upon his head. He displayed all the peculiarities of speech and manner I have noticed before, but he was much less timid, and stood by me for a long time talking of my domestic affairs, which were rather complicated, and giving me a detailed account of the accident which caused his death, and which had been always somewhat of a mystery. In doing this, he mentioned names of people hitherto unknown to me, but which I found on after inquiry to be true. He seemed quite delighted to be able to manifest so indisputably like himself, and remarked more than once. I'm not much like a girl now, am I, Ma? Next, Mrs. S.S. old lover came, of whom she was still considerably alarmed, and her father, who had been a great politician and a well-known man. Florence, too, of course, though never so lively through Miss Roberts as through other media, but still happy though pensive, and full of advice how I was to act when I reached England again. Presently a soft voice said, Aunt Flo, don't you know me? And I saw standing in front of me my niece and godchild, Lillian Thomas, who had died as a nun in the convent of the Dames Anglaises at Bruges. She was clothed in her nun's habit, which was rather peculiar, the face being surrounded by a white cap, with a crimped border that hid all the hair, and surmounted by a white veil of some heavy woollen material which covered the head and the black serge dress. Lillian had died of consumption, and the death-like, waxy complexion which she had had for some time before was exactly reproduced. She had not much to say for herself, indeed, we had been completely separated since she had entered the convent, but she was undoubtedly there. She was succeeded by my sister Emily, whom I have already so often described. And these apparitions, six in number, and all recognisable, were produced in the private room of Mrs. S. and myself, and with no other person but Virginia Roberts, sixteen years old. It was about this time that we received an invitation to attend a private séance in a large house in the city, occupied by Mr. and Mrs. Newman, who had Maud Lord staying with them as a visitor. Maud Lord's mediumship is a peculiar one. She places her sitters in a circle, holding hands. She then seats herself on a chair in the centre, and keeps on clapping her hands, to intimate that she has not changed her position. The seance is held in darkness, and the manifestations consist of direct voices, i.e. voices that everyone can hear, and by what they say to you, 
you must judge of their identity and truthfulness. I had only witnessed powers of this kind once before through Mrs. Bassett, who is now Mrs. Hearn, but as no one spoke to me through her whom I recognised, I have omitted to give any account of it. As soon as Maud Lord's sitting was fully established, I heard her addressing various members of the company, telling them who stood beside them, and I heard them putting questions to, or holding conversations with, creature who were invisible to me. The time went on, and I believed I was going to be left out of it, when I heard a voice close to my ear whisper. Arthur. At the same moment Maud Lord's voice sounded in my direction, saying that the lady in the brown velvet had had a gentleman standing near her, named Arthur, who wished to be recognised. I was the only lady present in a brown velvet hat, yet I could not recall any deceased friend of the name of Arthur who might wish to communicate with me. It is a constant occurrence at a seance that the mind refuses to remember a name, or a circumstance, and on returning home, perhaps the whole situation makes itself clear, and one wonders how one could have been so dull as not to perceive it. So I said that I knew no one in the spirit world of that name, and Maud Lord replied. Well, he knows you at all events. A few more minutes elapsed, when I felt a touch on the third finger of my left hand, and the voice spoke again and said. Arthur. Arthur's ring. Have you quite forgotten? This action brought the person to my memory, and I exclaimed, Oh. Johnny Cope, is it you? To explain this, I must tell my readers that when I went out to India in 1854, Arthur Cope of the Lancers was a passenger by the same steamer, and when we landed in Madras, he made me a present of a diamond ring, which I wore at that seance as a guard. But he was never called by anything but his nickname of Johnny, so that his real appellation had quite slipped my memory. The poor fellow died in 1856 or 1857, and I had been ungrateful enough to forget all about him, and should never have remembered his name had it not been coupled with the ring. It would have been still more remarkable, though, if Maud Lord, who had never seen me till that evening, had discovered an incident which happened thirty years before, and which I had completely forgotten. Before I had been many days in New York, I fell ill again from exposing myself to the weather, this time with a bad throat. Mrs. S. and I slept in the same room, and our sitting room opened into the bedroom. She was indefatigable in her attentions and kindness to me during my illness, and kept running backwards and forwards from the bedroom to the sitting room, both by night and day, to get me fresh poultices, which she kept hot on the steam stove. One evening about eleven o'clock she got out of bed in her nightdress, and went into the next room for this purpose. Almost directly after she entered it, I heard a heavy fall. I called her by name, and receiving no answer, became frightened, jumped out of bed, and followed her. To my consternation, I found her stretched out, at full length, on a white bearskin rug, and quite insensible. She was a delicate woman, and I thought at first that she had fainted from fatigue, but when she showed no signs of returning consciousness, I became alarmed. I was very weak myself from my illness, and hardly able to stand, but I managed to put on a dressing gown and summon the assistance of a lady who occupied the room next to us, and whose acquaintance we had already made. She was strong and capable, and helped me to place Mrs. S. upon the sofa, where she lay in the same condition. After we had done all we could think of to bring her to herself without effect, the next-door lady became frightened. She said to me, I don't like this. I think we ought to call in a doctor. Supposing she were to die without regaining consciousness. I replied, I should say the same, excepting I begin to believe she has not fainted at all, but is in a trance, and in that case, any violent attempts to bring her to herself might injure her. Just see how quietly she breathes, and how very young she looks. When her attention was called to this fact, the next-door lady was astonished. Mrs. S., who was a woman past forty, looked like a girl of sixteen. She was a very pretty woman, but with a dash of temper in her expression which spoiled it. Now with all the passions and lines smoothed out of it, she looked perfectly lovely. So she might have looked in death. But she was not dead. She was breathing. So I felt sure that the spirit had escaped for a while and left her free. I covered her up warmly on the sofa, and determined to leave her there till the trance had passed. After a while I persuaded the next-door lady to think as I did, and to go back to her own bed. As soon as she had gone, I administered my own poultice, and sat down to watch beside my friend. 
The time went on until seven in the morning, seven hours she had lain, without moving a limb, upon the sofa when, without any warning, she sat up and gazed about her. I called her by name, and asked her what she wanted, but I could see at once, by her expression, that she did not know me. Presently she asked me. Who are you? I told her. Are you Kate's friend? She said. I answered, yes. Do you know who I am? was the next question, which, of course, I answered in the negative. Mrs. S. thereupon gave me the name of a German gentleman which I had never heard before. An extraordinary scene then followed. Influenced by the spirit that possessed her, Mrs. S. rose and unlocked a cabinet of her own, which stood in the room, and taking thence a bundle of old letters, she selected several unread portions of them aloud to me. She then told me a history of herself and the gentleman whose spirit was speaking through her, and gave me several messages to deliver to herself the following day. It will be sufficient for me to say that this history was of so private a nature, that it was most unlikely she would have confided it to me or anyone, particularly as she was a woman of a most secretive nature, but names, addresses, and even words of conversations were given, in a manner which would have left no room for doubt of their truthfulness, even if Mrs. S. had not confirmed them to be facts afterwards. This went on for a long time, the spirit expressing the greatest animosity against Mrs. S. all the while, and then the power seemed suddenly to be spent, and she went off to sleep again upon the sofa, waking up naturally about an hour afterwards, and very much surprised to hear what had happened to her meanwhile. When we came to consider the matter, we found that this unexpected seizure had taken place upon the 17th of March, the day predicted by Mrs. Phillips four years previously as one on which a new era would commence for Mrs. S. From that time she continually went into trances, and used to predict the future for herself and others, but whether she has kept it up to this day I am unable to say, as I have heard nothing from her since I left America. That event took place on the 13th of June, 1885. We had been in the habit of spending our Sunday evenings in Miss Robert Seung's room and she begged me not to miss the last opportunity. When we arrived there, we found that the accompanist who usually played the harmonium for them was unable to be present, and Miss Roberts asked if I would be his substitute. I said I would, on condition that they moved the instrument on a line with the cabinet, so that I might not lose a sight of what was going on. This was accordingly done, and I commenced to play Thou Art Gone from my gaze. Almost immediately John Powell stepped out, dressed in uniform, and stood by the harmonium with his hand upon my shoulder. I never was much of a singer, you know, Flo. He said to me. But if you will sing that song with me, I'll try and go through it. And he actually did sing, after a fashion, the entire two verses of the ballad, keeping his hand on my shoulder the whole time. When we came to the line, I seek thee in vain by the meadow and stream, he stooped down and whispered in my ear. Not quite in vain, Flo, has it been? I do not know if my English spiritualistic friends can cap this story, but in America they told me it was quite a unique performance, particularly at a public seance, where the jarring of so many diverse influences often hinders instead of helping the manifestations. Powell's appeared to be especially strong on that occasion. Towards the middle of the evening a kind of whining was heard to proceed from the cabinet, and Miss Roberts, who was not entranced, said, there's a baby coming out for Miss Marriott. At the same time the face of little Yonnai appeared at the opening of the curtains, but nearly level with the ground, as she was crawling out on all fours. Before she had had time to advance beyond them, Powell stepped over her and came amongst us. Oh, Powell's! I exclaimed, you used to love my little babies. Do pick up that one for me that I may see it properly. He immediately returned, took up Yonnai and brought her out into the circle on his arm. The contrast of the baby's white kind of nightgown with his scarlet uniform was very striking. He carried the child to each sitter that it might be thoroughly examined, and when he had returned Yonnai to the cabinet, he came out again on his own account. That evening I was summoned into the cabinet myself by the medium's guide, a little Italian girl, who had materialized several times for our benefit. When I entered it, I stumbled up against Miss Roberts' chair. There was barely room for me to stand beside it. She said to me, Is that you, Miss Marriott? And I replied, Yes, didn't you send for me? She said, No, I didn't send, I know nothing about it. A voice behind me said, 
I sent for you. And at the same moment two strong arms were clasped round my waist, and a man's face kissed me over my shoulder. I asked, who are you, and he replied. Walk out of the cabinet and you shall see. I turned round, two hands were placed upon my shoulders, and I walked back into the circle with a tall man walking behind me in that position. When I could look at him in the gaslight, I recognised my brother, Frank Marriott, who died in 1855, and whom I had never seen since. Of course, the other spirits who were familiar with Mrs. S. and myself came to wish me a pleasant voyage across the Atlantic, but I have mentioned them all so often that I fear I must already have tired out the patience of my readers. But in order to be impressive it is so necessary to be explicit. All I can bring forward in excuse is, that every word I have written is the honest and unbiased truth. Here, therefore, ends the account of my experience in spiritualism up to the present moment, not, by any means, the half, nor yet the quarter of it, but all I consider likely to interest the general public. And those who have been interested in it may see their own friends as I have done, if they will only take the same trouble that I have done. Chapter 30 Key Bono My friends have so often asked me this question, that I think, before I close this book, I am justified in answering it, at all events, as far as I myself am concerned. How often have I sat, surrounded by an interested audience, who knew me too well to think me either a lunatic or a liar, and after I have told them some of the most marvellous and thrilling of my experiences, they have assailed me with these questions, but what is it? And what good does it do? What is it? There, my friends, I confess you stagger me. I can no more tell you what it is than I can tell you what you are or what I am. We know that, like Topsy, we grew. We know that, given certain conditions and favourable accessories, a child comes into this world, and a seed sprouts through the dark earth and becomes a flower, but though we know the cause and see the effect, the greatest man of science, or the greatest botanist, cannot tell you how the child is made, nor how the plant grows. Neither can I, or any one, tell you what the power is that enables a spirit to make itself apparent. I can only say that it can do so, and refer you to the creator of you and me and the entire universe. The commonest things the earth produces are all miracles, from the growing of a mustard seed to the expansion of a human brain. What is more wonderful than the hatching of an egg? You see it done every day. It has become so common that you regard it as an event of no consequence. You know the exact number of days the bird must sit to produce a live chicken with all its functions ready for nature's use, but you see nothing wonderful in it. All birds can do the same, and you would not waste your time in speculating on the wondrous effect of heat upon a liquid substance which turns to bone and blood and flesh and feathers. If you were as familiar with the reappearance of those who have gone before as you are with chickens, you would see nothing supernatural in their manifesting themselves to you, and nothing more miraculous than in the birth of a child or the hatching of an egg. Why should it be? Who has fixed the abode of the spirit after death? Who can say where it dwells? or that it is not permitted to return to this world, perhaps to live in it altogether. Still, however the Almighty sends them, the fact remains that they come, and that thousands can testify to the fact. As to the theory advanced by some people that they are devils, sent to lure us to our destruction, that is an insult to the wisdom or mercy of an omnipotent Creator. They cannot come except by His permission, just as He sends children to some people and withholds them from others. And the conversation of most of those that I have talked with is all on the side of religion, prayer, and self-sacrifice. My friends, at all events, have never denied the existence of a God or a Saviour. They have, on the contrary, and especially Florence, been very quick to rebuke me for anything I may have done that was wrong, for neglect of prayer and church-going, for speaking evil of my neighbours, or any other fault. They have continually inculcated the doctrine that religion consists in unselfish love to our fellow creatures, and in devotion to God. I do not deny that there are frivolous and occasionally wicked spirits about us. Is it to be wondered at? For one spirit that leaves this world calculated to do good to his fellow creatures, a hundred leave it who will do him harm. That is really the reason that the church discourages spiritualism. She does not disbelieve in it. She knows it to be true, but she also knows it to be dangerous. Since like attracts like, the numbers of thoughtless spirits who still dwell on earth would naturally attract the numbers of thoughtless spirits who have left it, a 
and their influence is best dispensed with. Talk of devils. I have known many more devils in the flesh than out of it, and could name a number of acquaintances who, when once passed out of this world, I should steadfastly refuse to have any communication with. I have no doubt myself whatever as to what it is, or that I have seen my dear friends and children as I knew them upon earth. But how they come or where they go, I must wait until I join them to ascertain, even if I shall do it then. The second question, however, I can more easily deal with, what good is it? The only wonder to me is that people who are not stone blind to what is going on in this world can put such a question. What good is it to have one's faith in immortality and another life confirmed in an age of free thought, scepticism and utter callousness? When I look around me and see the young men nowadays, a, eh, and the young women too, who believe in no hereafter, who lie down and die, like the dumb animals who cannot be made to understand the love of the dear God who created them although they feel it, I cannot think of anything calculated to do them more good than the return of a father or a mother or a friend. Who could convince them by ocular demonstration that there is a future life and happiness and misery, according to the one we have led here below? Oh, but, I seem to hear some readers exclaim, we do believe in all that you say. We have been taught so from our youth up, and the Bible points to it in every line. You may think you believe it, my friends, and in a theoretical way you may, but you do not realize it, and the whole of your lives proves it. Death instead of being the blessed portal to the life Elysian, the gate of which may swing open for you any day, and admit you to eternal and unfading happiness, is a far-off misty phantom, whose approach you dread, and the sight of which in others you run away from. The majority of people avoid the very mention of death. They would not look at a corpse for anything, the sight of a coffin or a funeral or a graveyard fills them with horror, the idea of it for themselves makes them turn pale with fright. Is this belief in the existence of a tender father and a blessed home waiting to receive them on the other side? Even professed Christians experience what they term a natural horror at the thought of death. I have known persons of fixed religious principles who had passed their lives, apparently, in prayer, and expressed their firm belief in heaven waiting for them, fight against death with all their mortal energies, and try their utmost to baffle the disease that was sent to carry them to everlasting happiness. Is this logical? It is tantamount in my idea to the pauper in the workhouse who knows that directly the gate is open to let him through, he will pass from skilly, oakum, and solitary confinement to the king's palace to enjoy youth, health, and prosperity evermore, and who, when he sees the gates beginning to unclose, puts his back and all his neighbours' backs against them to keep them shut as long as possible. Death should not be a horror to anyone, and if we knew more about it, it would cease to be so. It is the mystery that appalls us. We see our friends die, and no word or sign comes back to tell us that there is no death, so we picture them to ourselves mouldering in the damp earth till we nearly go mad with grief and dismay. Some people think me heartless because I never go near the graves of those whom I love best. Why should I? I might with more reason go and sit beside a pile of their cast-off garments. I could see them, and they would actually retain more of their identity and influence than the corpse which I could not see. I mourn their loss just the same, but I mourn it as I should do if they had settled for life in a far distant land, from which I could only enjoy occasional glimpses of their happiness. And I may say emphatically that the greatest good spiritualism does is to remove the fear of one's own death. One can never be quite certain of the changes that circumstances may bring about, nor do I like to boast overmuch. Disease and weakness may destroy the nerve I flatter myself on possessing, but I think I may say that as matters stand at present I have no fear of death whatever, and the only trouble I can foresee in passing through it will be to witness the distress of my friends. But when I remember all those who have gathered on the other side, and who my family believe will be present to help me in my passage there, I can feel nothing but a great curiosity to pierce the mysteries as yet unrevealed to me, and a great longing for the time to come when I shall join those whom I loved so much on earth not to be happy at once by any manner of means. I am too sinful a mortal for that, but to work out my salvation in the way God sees best for me, to make my own heaven or hell according as I have loved and succoured my fellow creatures here below. Yet however much I may be destined to suffer, never without hope and assistance from those whom I have loved, and never without feeling that through the goodness of God each struggle or reparation brings me near to the fruition of eternal happiness. This is my belief. This is the good that the certain knowledge that we can never die has done for me, 
and the worst I wish for anybody is that they may share it with me. Oh! Though oft depressed and lonely, all my fears are laid aside. If I but remember only, such as these have lived and died,